Let's get into the Word of God tonight. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I'm so thankful again for this great privilege we have to open up your word. And God, in this country where so much of what we've been used to has been taken away and, and we, can, we could spend hours debating on why and, and the legitimacy of all of that, but one thing I am super thankful that has not been taken away is our ability to connect with you through this online ministry and worship you and open up your word and let you speak right into our hearts, Lord. That has not been hindered in any way. Um, Lord, of course, the enemy sometimes uses the frailty of technology with the internets there at the homes. And so I just pray right now that you would strengthen the signal at every house, that God, this service would go off without, without a hitch, and we would be able to just hear your heart, hear your mind, and be more like you by the time we have here tonight. God, I thank you for every family making the, the commitment to connect, Lord, uh, with you and with our church together online this evening. And I pray that you would bless every one of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we continue our study in the book of Acts. And remember, Acts was written by the same guy that wrote the book we just finished. That would be the Gospel of Luke. That would be Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke is the author of Acts. He is the only Gentile to write a book of the New Testament. He is the only doctor to write a book of the New Testament. And he is the primary author of the New Testament. Paul the Apostle, who we will see tonight, meet tonight for the first time, and start to get into his story a little bit next week. But Paul the Apostle, will write more books than Luke, but not more content. And so Luke is the primary author of the New Testament. And as he writes Acts, Acts is so good for so many reasons, but one of them, I know you know, but I'm going to say it again, Acts is the bridge from the Gospels to the New Testament epistles. And if we didn't have Acts, we'd be lost because we would see Jesus at the end of John 21, at the end of each of the Gospels. He's alive. He's ascended back to heaven and, and where he's interceding for you and me. But then if the next chapter was Romans 1, we'd all wonder, how did the church get to Rome? And who's this Paul guy? And why should I listen to him? But because we have the book of Acts, we don't have those questions. We know how the gospel spread to the Gentile world. And we are well familiar, at least if you're new to Bible study, maybe you're not yet, but you will by the end of next week. Uh, we'll get to know Paul and see who he was. And then, of course, the rest of the book centers around him and his ministry. So number one, the book of Acts tells the story of what happens between the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. But the other thing about the book of Acts is it is the only book, or one of the only books, that has its own divine outline. God outlines the book for us. Jesus says himself in Acts chapter 1, before he ascends to heaven, he says to the apostles there in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and because of that, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The book of Acts is, is the story of how the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, the middle parts of Israel, to the ends of the earth. And we'll begin to see that transition. Tonight, we're still, the church is still in Jerusalem. Next week, we'll see it transition through the ministry of Philip and others to Samaria and Judea. And then finally, we'll see Paul the Apostle in chapter 10, through the end of the book, chapter 28, take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But tonight, for the last night, actually, we're still in the church just centered there in Jerusalem. But tonight, the focus moves, even though the church is still the story of the church in Jerusalem, the focus moves from Peter and John and the primary apostles, the story moves to the ministry of a man by the name of Stephen. And for you note takers tonight, our study will divide into four parts, each of them looking at an aspect of this great man of God, Stephen. We're going to see Stephen the servant, we're going to see Stephen the accused, then we'll see Stephen the historian, and finally, Stephen the martyr. So look at those one at a time. Look with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, and we see the background of Stephen, why he came into prominence in the early church, and we see it's because he had the heart of a servant. It says there in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. 
Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may, we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procturus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, we covered these verses last Sunday, and so I won't take too long with them here tonight, but just so we're all on the same page and we see the context of where this great man of God, Stephen, comes from, as chapter 6 opens here in the book of Acts, the church in Jerusalem is rapidly growing. We know from multiple reliable historical sources that says that the church before the conversion of Saul, so we're, we're moving a few months in after the early days of Pentecost and we're heading towards uh, chapter 9 and the conversion of Saul, which was uh, some bit of time after the early church was first started. But by that moment, which is a turning point in the book of Acts, by the conversion of Saul, the church in Jerusalem numbered somewhere between 13 and 15,000 thousand converts and believers in Jesus. You know, we saw in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 get saved. And in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 3, uh, another, another 5,000 get saved. So that's 8,000 believers. We, we've read multiple times, and here again in chapter 6, verse 1, that the disciples were multiplying. They, they, were, they were adding to one another. They were multiplying from there. And so as chapter 6 opens, as you put the historical sources together, the church about this time is 13 to 15,000 people. And yes, they would meet from house to house to pray together, but you can't fit 15,000 people in anybody's house, even Caesar Nero's house. And so they would meet there on the Temple Mount in Solomon's porch, and they would just grow and grow spiritually and numerically. And yet, as every growing church will tell you, with more numbers comes more opportunity for ministry. You certainly can do more as a church the more people you have and resources you have. But the other thing that inevitably happens the more people you get is it comes with more problems. More people, as wonderful as people are, people have with them issues and problems. And this church that in just a, just a short amount of time has gone from 120 believers in the upper room in Acts chapter 1 to 13 to 15,000 people, they're a church that honestly experienced problems. So we see here in Acts 6 one of the problems. The Bible describes that the Hellenists were complaining that their widows were not getting the same of attention as the Hebrew widows. Now, some definitions and explanations. Hellenists, who were they? Well, they were Greeks. As Alexander the Great conquered the known world in 323 BC, he not only conquered the world militarily, but culturally as well. He brought Greek thought, Greek philosophy, Greek government, Greek culture to the known world of the day. And this type of thinking, this type of thought, this type of culture, and even the people were known as Hellenistic. Why Hellenistic? Because the Greek word for Greek is Hellenos, Hellas. And so that's why they would call them Hellenistic. It's the Greek word for Greek. So in Israel, a, a nation that had been dominated by Greek empires for years, there were those who were in the nation that were religiously Jews, but ethnically and culturally Greeks, and they were known as the Hellenists. And many of those living in Israel, as they become, they become Jews because they had lived there in Israel for some time, now they were becoming Christians and they have a problem with the way that the early church was taking care of they, the Greek widows. 
You know, taking care of orphans and widows is one of the most basic things a church can do. Jesus' half-brother James writes in his epistle, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Taking care of orphans and widows is still important in our world today, but it was even more important in the first century simply because, number one, there were a lot more orphans in the world. I know we still have them in our world today, but the numbers were far greater in the first century. And then more than that, if you were a lady who lost your husband, this was a world before Social Security. It was a world before you ladies could go out and get a job. There was not many jobs available to you in the first century world. And so it was a huge financial burden if suddenly your husband or an elder son was not around to take care of you. So the church rightfully took that burden on and cared for those that were vulnerable in their midst and needed their help. But the problem the early church is facing is the Greek people were saying, you church leaders are really good at taking care of the Hebrew widows, but you've neglected our widows, the Greek ethnically widows there in Jerusalem. And we can understand, hum, you, know, hum, you know, just in humanity how that happened, how it was perceived to have happened. This 15,000-person church, though there were Hellenists, there were people of a, of a Greek descent, it was by and large primarily Jewish. It was Jewish, not, not just in their former religion, but ethnically, this was a Jewish church. All of the 12 apostles, all of the leaders were ethnically Jewish. And so here is a primarily Jewish church with a totally Jewish leadership. And on the outskirts, these Greeks that had gotten saved, well, they feel like their needs aren't being met. And as we talked about on Sunday, I just love how the early church handled this because it's such a blueprint for us on how to face problems that we do and will continue to face. What did they do? Well, no doubt they prayed. Uh, it doesn't say they prayed. Well, <laughs> the apostles say it's not good for us to leave the word and prayer. Obviously, they're committed to pray. They, they prayed, which is the first step in any problem we face as a church. We go before the Lord and say, God, how do you want to fix this? And as the Lord spoke to them and directed them, it says the 12 apostles, don't, don't, they don't go to the Hellenist widows and say, hey, we are so sorry we did this. We're on the job. We will now be in charge of making sure you get an equal distribution of the help coming from the church. That's not what they said. And as a human who loves people and personally happens to also be a pastor, I understand the draw to fix the problem that way. Anytime I get an email or someone pulls me aside and says, do you know what's happening in the church? My first instinct is, I am pastor. I will fix your problem. I will get in there. And if, if you're not being visited at home, well, I'll find it in the schedule and I'll get over to your house. And, oh, you, you need a meal. Well, my family will cook it up for you. And, and, and that's my natural just instinct. Because why? I genuinely care for you guys. I, I, I feel like God is, has laid upon me this wonderful, and I say wonderful, this, this, this burden of our church. I don't mean burden as in bad, but this, this weight that, 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 that myself and the other leaders were responsible responsible for what's happening here at the church and yet and yet though though I I think that's a that, that's a that's a sweet heart that says I want to take care of everybody notice what the apostles said they said it's not good for us to leave the word of God and serve tables and where I know that sounds very self-serving at first like the apostles are saying we're too good to serve people Friends, what we clearly know from both the Bible and church history is these 12 guys were not above serving people. That was, that was never, ever the issue. The issue they understood is their role, their role as the leaders of the early church, their role as the 12 apostles sent to care for the Jewish church in Jerusalem, their role was to study the word, to teach the word, and to spend time talking with God about the church so that he could lead the church through them. That was their mandate from God. 
They were to study the word of God. They were to teach the word of God. And they were to hang out with God so God could lead the church through them as they talked to him in prayer. And they understood something that we struggle with sometimes in church leadership today. They, they understood if I leave that, if I leave what God has called me to do and start filling all the holes that every church has on occasion, well then what I was supposed to do will then become the new hole the church has. And the new complaint will be, we're not being taught the word. And who's driving this ship? No one seems to be leading this thing. So, so yes, now the widows are taken care of, but the greater need of being taught the word of God, the greater need to the whole of being led by the Spirit, that would then go by the wayside. So the apostles wisely, no doubt, led by the Lord, led by the Holy Spirit, say, we will stick with the word and prayer, but then I love it, I love it. They don't then say, so ignore the widows. There's a small part of the church. They don't really matter. That's not what they said at all. They know that every person in God's family is important. They know the Greek widows need to be taken care of just like the Hebrew widows needed to be taken care of. So instead of ignoring the problem like some churches would have done, instead of pretending like it's just those sensitive Greeks that we need to ignore... No, the apostles say, we know what we're supposed to do. We're going to stick with what God told us to do, but we're also going to make sure this need gets met. And how are we going to do it? We're going to find, notice, seven men, and I love it, who are full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. Not newbies, not who can we trick into serving tables, who's who's so brand new they don't know what grunt work in the church is like, so we're going to trick those individuals into serving. No, they find seven men full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And by the way, all seven of those men happen to be Hellenists as well. Every one of their names are Greek names. And I just... Just see the wisdom of this. The Greek widows need help, so they appoint some Greek men who are full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, to be able to meet those needs. It's wisdom. It isn't that what God promises to give us? He says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to each one liberally and without reproach. You, you know, God doesn't always promise to give us health. I, I, wish, I wish he did. I wish every time we were sick, we just pray and get better instantly. That would be awesome, but God does teach us some great things through sickness, doesn't he? He doesn't say to always give us wealth. That would be kind of good too. Huh? I got a bill, Lord, but nothing in the bank. Oh, and then all of a sudden the money shows up. That would be kind of fun, but oh, we learn things by trusting God in those, those times that are lean, don't we? God doesn't always promise to give us wealth. He doesn't always promise to give us health but he does always promise to give you wisdom. And when I come to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what direction to go. I know the answer's on the way because God says, I, I love it that you don't want to be led by your own instincts. I love it that you don't, you, don't, you don't pridefully assume that you know what's best. I love that you're coming to me and just saying, God, what do you want to do? We ask for wisdom. God gives wisdom. God gives these apostles the wisdom to have these these men that are Hellenists themselves take care of the the distribution to the the Hellenist widows. And these men were entrusted by the apostles to fix the issue. They laid hands on them. In other words, they commissioned them in front of the people and they just let them go. And here they are just serving the Lord right where they were at, not asking, when do I get to be an apostle? When do I get to do the important stuff? When do I, how long do I have to serve tables and take Take care of widows. <laughs> they didn't have that heart at all. And I know you know that God doesn't see one ministry as more important than others. My, God doesn't see my ministry as a, as a teacher, as a pastor, more important than the, the people that are behind the scenes of the camera right now, editing videos and making them get uploaded. God doesn't see me more important than them. No, that's, that's, that's not how God sees it at all. He sees the heart that is faithful no matter what he tells that servant to do, He sees that as successful in the eyes of the Lord in ministry. And the fruit, the fruit of these seven men, well, it says the number of the disciples just continued to grow. And then then Dr. Luke adds this little note that even a great number of the priests, those those are Jewish Levitical priests, started getting saved. We know historically that there were 8,000 priests serving in Jerusalem at this time. 8,000. So what is a great number of them? What what was that number? We're not told, but (laughs) the church is just expanding. Why? 
because everyone is doing what God had called them to do. The church gets into more trouble when, when, I, when I say, you know, I, I, really, I really love worship, so I think, I think I should be the new worship leader here. Well, <laughs> I, I guess I could make that decision as the pastor, but, but I, I love it that we, we have teams of people and Jared leading us as, as leading us in worship. That's, that's awesome. That's God doing what God's called them to do. I, 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 I know that, you know, I, I could... I say, I know I could. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do what Holly and our media team does and create flyers and graphics. It would, it would look so cheesy. No one would, people would be embarrassed to come to church if I was in charge of that. I'm so glad that we have, we have Holly doing what God has called her to do and Austin with his amazing ear for sound and so much that he adds to our church and our staff. Our youth pastors loving and pouring into kids. Ch- Courtney doing children. Robert with the men and just so many around here saying, I'm going to do what God called me to do. Uh, my wife and the ladies, ministering the ladies. I'm going to do what God called me to do. Even some of you watching Amy right now, translating the, the service into American Sign Language, just doing what God has called her to do. Listen, a church works best when we don't say, I'm jealous of his job. When do I get to do what that person does? A church works best when we say, God, what do you want me to do? And we do it with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's Stephen, a man full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and he just says, I'm going to serve you right where I'm at. And we learn more of his story in verse 8. Look with, look with me there in chapter 6, verse 8. It says, and Stephen, he's one of those seven guys appointed to take care of Hellenist widows. It says, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freed men, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. And they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, notice, saw his face as the face of an angel. After Stephen faithfully served the needs of the church, whatever they may be, taking care of widows, taking care of tables, then God sees fit and allows him to start doing things that as humans we would be impressed with, wonders and signs. And although hopefully I have been really clear that God doesn't see it that way, he's probably more impressed with someone who's just willing to wait a table than someone who does signs and wonders, but here we see Stephen doing something that, that most people around him would say, well, that's, that's important stuff now. And though, again, I don't think God sees it that way, it's a great principle for us to consider. When we're faithful in the small things God entrusts to us, it's then that he entrusts us to things that we, as human beings, may consider greater ministry. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16. He says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And God told the prophet Zechariah, for who has despised the day of small things? As we remain faithful in the quote-unquote little things, God can then entrust us with much more. Those seven men in the early verses of Acts 6 were just being faithful, and though we don't know all of their stories, We do know a few. We see Stephen's here. Stephen will go on to be the first martyr of the church. Jesus himself will stand and welcome him into heaven. We'll see at the end of chapter 7 tonight. Stephen gives one of the greatest Jewish biblical history lessons anywhere in the scripture. Philip, who we'll meet next week, will be a great evangelist. And his ministry will lead a continent of believers to Jesus. We read of Procurus, who church history tells us was the traveling companion and assistant to the Apostle John. And after John's death, he pastored one of the largest churches that was started by the Apostle John. 
God used all of these men, I'm sure, beyond what they could have imagined for themselves. So the lesson is be faithful in the little things. You, you, you want to be entrusted with more. You, you, you have a hard time seeing the simple things as important. So you want, you want more ministry. Can I just lovingly encourage you? Be faithful with what God has entrusted to you right now. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Jason. You're the senior pastor. You don't do anything you don't want to do. Well, that's certainly not a true statement. But beyond that fact... I didn't start out fresh out of Bible college with the privilege of pastoring the garden. No, I started as an intern, which is church code for free employee. I started as an intern at Calvary Chapel Vista, and there was so many of us back then doing that that I would spend all afternoons, many afternoons, wiping invisible spots that I didn't see off of walls. And I would, so what's my ministry job today? Oh, your job is to take this rag and go through all these hallways and wipe the rag. I, what am I wiping off? All those spots. I would, just, I would just go, I don't see any spots. Oh, they're there. Scrub greatly. And, and just for hours, for hours, I would, I would scrub those walls. No one, no one ever asked me to teach a Wednesday night. No one ever asked me to do a Sunday morning. The first, the first Sunday morning Bible study I ever taught outside of youth ministry was in a church that I started. Like I just, that's, no, nobody, nobody gave me opportunities. I just, I just was trying to be faithful right where God wanted me to be faithful. And like God so often does, he then can entrust to you things later on. Stephen does exactly that. God opened up doors for him to do ministry, signs and wonders, miracles for the people. And yet all of that suddenly stopped when he was taken by what Dr. Luke calls there in Acts chapter 6, verse 9, the synagogue of the freed men. You see, Jerusalem still to this day is divided into quarters, different, different sections. Today, there's a, a Muslim quarter and a Jewish quarter and an Armenian cult quarter and a Christian quarter. But, 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 it, but back, back in the first century, it was the same way. And they had, a, they had a quarter of Jerusalem back then that was reserved for people who lived there who were freed. You see, the Jews lived under the oppression of the Roman Empire. But there are other parts of the empire that were free. They were free citizens of Rome. And they were living there. Some of them were in Jerusalem as well. And they were, they were Jewish in their faith and understanding, though, though not you know, totally ethnically. And, and, and yet they had a little section of Jerusalem that they lived in. And they had a synagogue dedicated to them. They were, they were freed men, not like the rest of the Jews under the Roman oppression. Well, this, this, this synagogue of, of Roman free men, what's interesting to me about it is Dr. Luke mentions that those who attended the synagogue were from the freed sections of the Roman Empire, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, those from Asia, and notice, those from Sicilia. Why is that important? Because Saul of Tarshish, who will become Paul the Apostle, Tarshish was in Sicilia. So Paul would have been a part of this synagogue. What's even more interesting to me than that is historical tradition is it was the same synagogue that questioned Jesus. It was the same synagogue that had the apostles questioned separately. And so we're seeing really that this synagogue, more than any other, is determined to crush Christianity. And so they bring Stephen before the synagogue and they try the same playbook with him they tried on Jesus, falsely accusing him of coming against Moses, falsely accusing him of wanting to tear down the temple. But I love it. They're accusing him of being against Moses and yet all the while Stephen's face is shining, the scripture says, like an angel the whole time. Now why is that important? Because maybe you remember the story, but Moses... He would go in, he would spend time in the presence of God, remember? And when he comes out of spending time with the presence of God, what was Moses' face doing? It was shining. It was shining. So here they are accusing Stephen of being against Moses, whose face glowed. <laughs> and yet, here's Stephen right in front of him with his face glowing as well. And I, I, could just, I can just see that, <laughs> that them thinking through what they're saying. They're like, you're against Moses. And everybody's like, he kind of reminds us of Moses. Look what's going on right then. And I just love how the Lord always gets the last word. Y you that, that are being persecuted, whether that's people in your own family, whether that's people at, at work, when we, when we get back to that season in our lives and you have, you have people that just, that just come against you, can I tell you, the Lord will always have the last word. 
the Bible never tells us that we're going to go through life without trouble and problems. In fact, it says the exact opposite. In this life, you shall have tribulation with a little t. You're going to have problems. You're going to have troubles. But God always has the last word. He always does. He will always set things right in the end. And he, I just see him doing that here with, with these religious leaders. They're, they're complaining that he's against Moses, and yet he's the one with the shining face. And we see Stephen the servant, Stephen being accused. And then as chapter 7 opens, we see Stephen the historian. And as we read this, what a great commentary Romans 7 is on much of the Old Testament. You know, it's been said that the greatest commentary of, of the Bible is the Bible itself. And one of the greatest ways to prove that is here in Acts chapter 7. We get insights from things that Stephen says about the events of Genesis and 1 Samuel that we don't get from the Old Testament. We don't get from the Jewish scriptures. But even though we, we get these insights, Stephen's point is not just to give them insights on Jewish history. Stephen's point, as we read together, is you fellas have a history. Your forefathers have a history of rejecting the one person God sent to them as his representative. You've done that over and over and over again, and you've done it with Jesus. You're doing it now with the early church. You're behaving the way you have always behaved. That's the main point. So keep that in mind. It's a little bit of reading, but we'll be okay. But let's read most of chapter 7 together and just hear this sermon of Stephen's and the biblical insight he has. Chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of that land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not, e not enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and they would bring them into the bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom will it be in bondage, I will judge, God said. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into slavery. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. And when Jacob heard that there was, no, there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dwelt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they may not live. And at this time, Moses was born and he was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deed. Now when he was 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to the two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at that saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. 
And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not to look. And the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet for this place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groanings, and they have come down to deliver them. And now come, and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, and after he had showed them wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brother, and him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angel who spoke with him on the Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received living or oracles to give to us whom our fathers would not obey but rejected and in their heart they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron make us gods to go before us as for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt we don't know what's become of him and they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to the idols and rejoiced in the works of their own hands then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven that is written in the book of the prophets did you not Offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel. You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rephaim, images which you made to worship I will carry away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and he appointed, instructed Moses to make it according to the pattern which he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought it with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out from before the face of our fathers until the days of David who found favor before God and asked him to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff neck and uncircumcised and hardened ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. I know it's a lot of reading, but what is Stephen doing here? He's going through the Jewish scriptures and showing them this, this way that they were with Jesus, rejecting the very one that God sent them, the cornerstone. That was a pattern that repeated over and over again in their history. He goes through Abraham, and Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. But he, but he pauses there, Stephen does, for a second and says, Joseph. Joseph, this one that God had a unique plan for. God knew that God would send Joseph to, to Egypt, and, and because of the mind that God had given Joseph, he was going to save Egypt from this famine, this seven-year famine that was coming upon the land. And by saving Egypt, he was going to save not only the surrounding nations, but his own people, the Jewish people. God had picked Joseph. He gave him dreams as he was a 17-year-old a kid about his brothers bowing down to him one day. God had put it in Joseph's heart who he was to be a leader among his brothers. But you know who rejected it? His brothers. <laughs> they rejected it so much they were going to kill him and then they mercifully thought, well, we'll just throw him in a pit and then sell him into slavery. What mercy. And, and, and Joseph ends up rejected by his brothers. And even, even years later, as Joseph has this amazing ministry there in Egypt, when the brothers first come, they don't recognize him. They, they, don't, they don't want to follow him, even when they find out it's his brother. They're very, they're very skeptical that he's not going to harm them the minute their, their father dies. They, they just basically reject him and live on an outskirt of him. And that didn't stop with, with Joseph. It says then that, a, that another pharaoh that didn't know Joseph arose. When we did the book of Exodus in the first chapter, if you want to go back and listen to Exodus chapter 1, we got into the history of, of what happens with the Egyptian kings and how different dynasties from even different regions of the world came and ruled in Egypt. And, and what Stephen is describing here, and it's described in Exodus as well, is a dynasty of kings that weren't connected to Joseph in any way came to power. 
and they saw the Jews as not descendants of their, one of their deliverers, Joseph. They, they saw the Jews as a, as, a, as a pest, a danger. And so they began to oppress them and enslave them. And yet God worked behind the scenes, didn't he? And he brought about Moses. And Moses was found by Pharaoh's daughter there in the Nile River and raised in the house of Pharaoh and, and became this, this great leader in, in, in Egyptian history. And yet J Moses always knew, I'm supposed to be the deliverer of my people. But you know who didn't know that? <laughs> the people. They reject him when he tries to come before them and say, why are you fighting among yourselves? Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And, and, and they reject him. And, and it didn't stop then, did it? And Moses spends 40 years in the wilderness learning how to be humble and learning how to trust the Lord. And then he comes back and the people don't want anything to do with him. Even though he's the one that, that literally puts his staff out and, and the Red Sea parts. You'd think if you were a leader... <laughs> and, you, and, and, your, and your walking stick divides a body of water that everybody would have no questions from that moment forward. And if that wasn't enough, the minute you hit a rock and water comes out of a rock, you, you guys know that water doesn't come out of a rock, right? So it, the minute they, you think that you'd have no questions, for, but that's not, they, they're always, the, the rest of their history is not listening to Moses, not wanting to follow Moses, always wanting to go back to Egypt. Stephen brings up David. David's another one. David was a man after God's own heart. I personally believe David was the king he wanted to give Israel all along. He writes, he tells him in the book of Deuteronomy that when, when Israel, when you have kings, I want that king to copy a, a copy of the law for himself. In other words, what I'm saying is in Deuteronomy, long before there ever was a king, God talks about how a king is supposed to behave. God always intended to give him a king, but they wanted Saul. <laughs> they wanted someone earlier than God. God always intended to give him David, and David, oh yes, he had, a, he had, he had all kinds of problems but he was a great king and a great leader. And yet, for the early days of his leadership, they don't want anything to do with him. People are selling him out to King Saul. And then even when Saul dies, they give him one tribe to rule, one tribe. They, they, they let the 11, other 11 tribes be ruled by the, the, the sons of Saul that just have no business being in leadership. This is their greatest king ever, humanly, and they just reject him. And, and Stephen's point is, God sent you Joseph. You rejected him. God sent you Moses. The guy part of the Red Sea. You rejected him. God sent you David. And you, you gave him one little tribe. This is your pattern. This is how you believe. So why do you think it's strange that you rejected Jesus? It's, it's what you do. It's what your fathers always do. You always reject the Holy Spirit, Stephen says. And by the way, that brings up an interesting theological point because there are wonderful Christians that teach that it's impossible for you and I to reject the Holy Spirit. They call it irresistible grace, that God has a grace that is so irresistible that you will always do what God has told you to do. Well, I, I hear that. And believe me, I, I'm the first one to say God, God's will will ultimately done in this world absolutely correct. But do I as an individual have the ability to resist God? Unfortunately, I know from personal experience that's true. I've resisted God when I knew God was wanting me to do. And I see that contradicting the scripture as well. Jesus himself would say to Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. Kind of like kind of like the forerunner of Stephen's sermon is what Jesus says here. You kill the prophets and the stone those who were sent to you. He says, listen, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Here's God in the flesh saying, I wanted to do this, but you were not willing and you resisted me. It goes right along with Stephen's sermon who says, you guys always resist the Holy Spirit. You see, the truth is, God in his sovereignty has allowed sovereignly man to have a free will. And part of the reason I believe for that is it makes our worship and commitment to him meaningful. You can choose not to follow the Lord. You can choose to go off and do your own thing, but, but, but you don't. Well, I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not either. 
But here you are tonight, wanting to study his word, wanting to grow. That's meaningful to God. I really believe it is. Forced, forced commitment is, is terrible. I mean, you know, when, 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 when Christy and I said our vows almost 20 years ago this summer, wow. But, but 19 plus years ago, there was no guns involved on that day. <laughs> she was there of her own free will. Her dad walked her down the aisle, handed her hand to mine. And when the pastor said, do you? She said, I do. I don't know why. I see what you see. It's really questionable to me why my wife would love and be committed to me. But because there was no gun involved, I'm not worried. If there was, I'd be sleeping with one eye open every night because thinking, when is she going to get her comeuppance? When is she going to, when is she going to rebel again? But there's not because it's, it's a free will commitment and it means something to me. And I, and I, I just, I just imagine the Lord's the same way. You're, you're choosing tonight to worship him. You're choosing tonight to draw close to him. And God says, that's meaningful. You're not a robot pre-programmed. You're a free moral agent who's saying, God, I'm not perfect, but I just want to love you. And I want to come into your presence and I want to pour out my heart. And, and, and that's the good side of it. But the flip side of our free will is this. Just like the Jews had done constantly in the story of the Old Testament as they were doing with Jesus and then the early church, you and I also have the ability to resist the Holy Spirit, to reject what God wants to do in our lives. And may and may the people of Jerusalem in the first century be a cautionary tale to you and me because they rejected the witness of Jesus, they rejected the witness of the apostles, and yet very soon, less than 40 years from this encounter, we're reading about here in Acts chapter 7, Jerusalem would be left desolate. Why? Because they rejected their day, their visitation from their God who came to save. We can reject what God wants us to do, but let's not, church. Let's follow him and obey him with all that we are. Stephen, this great historian, but what he's known best for, the last thing tonight, and that is Stephen, the martyr, the first martyr of the church. Well, Jesus, well, I, but anyways, you know what I mean. Verse 54, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. That language is just so descriptive, isn't it? And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus at the right hand of God, standing at the right hand of God, notice, and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And when they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was a great servant. He was a great Bible scholar and historian in Jewish history. But what Stephen is known best for, of course, is his martyrdom. This synagogue put Stephen to death. Now, if you've been listening carefully, if we have studied the Gospel of Luke and now the book of Acts, this should make you pause for a second. Wait a second. They put him to death. Remember, I told you when we were studying the Gospels, the Jews had lost the right of capital punishment. In other words, they had lost the right to impose the death penalty in their country. Rome had taken away that right in 6 AD, 27 years before this day in Acts chapter 7. So with that information, how in the world did these men put Stephen to death? Well, we're told by the Jewish historian Josephus that the Jews had a provision in their agreement with Rome 
that if someone was guilty of blasphemy or another religious crime worthy of death, not a civil matter, but a religious matter, then they could put that man to death never in full view of the people, never on the streets, never publicly. But if that person happened to be on their territory, their synagogues, their Sanhedrin, their religious buildings, then in that case, and in that case only, they could, without penalty from Rome, put that person to death. But as you think through that provision that we see a historical evidence of, well, then why didn't they do it to Jesus? Jesus was accused of a religious crime. They had to trump up these charges to get Pilate to condemn them. Jesus was accused of a religious blasphemy. So why didn't they put Jesus to death in the halls of the Sanhedrin? Why did they go through the whole song and dance, you remember, of having him go before Pilate and go before Herod and go before Pilate again when they could have put him to death in their own Sanhedrin? Why? Because a thousand years before, David had said that the Messiah was not going to be killed by having rocks thrown at his head, which was the Jewish way to put people to death. The Bible had prophesied a thousand years before, hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented, that his hands would be pierced, that Jesus would be crucified. And friends, let this be another example to you. God always keeps his word. For some reason that we're not told in the scriptures, the Jews didn't use their little their little trump card. Oh, he's in the Sanhedrin. Let's kill him now. They beat him close to the end of his life there in the, in the Sanhedrin buildings. But they didn't put him to death because God had a different plan. That Jesus would die publicly on the road for all to see, opening up his arms both physically and spiritually to all that would respond to him. God had promised that's the way it would be. And so they didn't kill Jesus in a back room. They didn't kill Jesus out of sight of everyone. They went through the channels to get Rome's approval, and even though Pilate didn't want to do it, Rome gave its approval, and Jesus died publicly for you and for me because that is what the Scripture foretold. I love the Word of God. I love that God values his word even above his name. And his name, oh, there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Why do we take time to study the Bible on Wednesday nights? There's so many other things you could be doing right now. Why do we take time to get up and read it in the morning? It's just a book. No, it's so much more than that. It is the living, breathing, powerful sword of the Spirit. And the things that you and I take from the word of God, we can trust them and live our lives by them. Why? Because every single time God says something, it is going to come to pass. No matter the historical probabilities, no matter whether it makes sense to us, God's word will always stand. Jesus killed publicly. Stephen put to death because he's in their religious establishment, the synagogue of the freed men. And as they're beginning to stone him, to throw rocks at his head until he dies, the Bible describes him looking up into heaven and seeing the God of glory. And then I love it. He sees Jesus standing. You know, every other time we see Jesus portrayed in the heavens, he's sitting. He's sitting at the right hand of God. And I love that because, you know, <laughs> I don't know about you, but as I go through my life, I, I picture Jesus in heaven pacing, you know, kind of biting his fingernails like, I don't know how this is going to work out for you, Duff. I, I just don't know. I don't know how you're going to figure this out. That's, that's kind of an issue. That's how I picture it because I'm, I'm kind of a worrier. So, so I, I picture Jesus nervous like I'm nervous. And it's so refreshing for me to realize, no, 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 he's seated. He's like, oh, I got this. I got what you're going to face. It's going to be okay. He's seated. Except here, he stands and he welcomes Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He welcomes him into heaven, knowing that he will be the first of thousands and thousands and thousands that would give their life for the Lord. 
I see this man, Stephen, a man who is a faithful servant of the Lord, just willing to do whatever God wants, a man who clearly knew the word of God and was a student of the scripture, such a great godly man. Why? Why would God allow him to die? Similar questions we ask all the time. And the answer is fairly simple. Because sometimes that's just the way it goes. God always does what is good. And where I'm sure for the friends and family of Stephen, they would say, well, that wasn't good. My question when anyone says that about God's work in our lives is, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know in your finite human perspective that the thing you're upset about wasn't good? How do you know? Well, because death is never good. Well, I think emotionally Jesus would agree with you. He calls death an enemy. He died to someday defeat sin and death on a permanent basis. He knows personally how sad it is to lose a loved one. He lost loved ones. So emotionally, I think Jesus would agree with you. But how do you know intellectually in God's work in the world, him taking a believer to heaven isn't good and that God will not use it for good in the world? How do you know? For we see with Stephen's martyrdom, this was a radical turning point. The church at this point is in Jerusalem, and basically Jerusalem only. And they're there, why? Because, oh, there's, there's, there's angry conversations with the priests. There's angry conversations with the Sanhedrin. But nothing really has happened yet. And the church is just growing 120, 3,000, now 8,000, now 15,000. Now a good chunk of 8,000 priests got saved. I don't know, is there 25,000 people now in the church? We don't know but they're kind of comfortable. And the martyrdom of Stephen changes everything because Stephen will just be the first of many in the city of Jerusalem that will die for their faith. And because of the intense persecution that will follow, the church begins to disperse. And do what? Do exactly what Jesus outlined, remember? In Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. That's been the first seven chapters then Judea, Samaria, the outer parts of Israel, and then to the ends of the earth. And the catalyst for that, a lot of it, was this persecution going on in Jerusalem. It started this great dispersion of these believers throughout the Roman Empire. Now, that doesn't mean that God isn't still working in Israel. He is today. My father-in-law is a great ministry, the Shepherd's Light, that ministers in Tel Aviv and, 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 and all, all over the nation of Israel and in major cities, teaching the word of God, taking care of the poor, doing very similar things to what we see the Church of Jerusalem doing 2,000 years ago. And we at the Garden are privileged to partner with that ministry going on over there as he and bros and so many of the leadership over there just, just serve Jesus. God, God's still at work in the Jewish people. That's that's never stopped. But the main thrust of why there's a church in, in Bermuda Dunes called the Garden is the church left Jerusalem. We're an outflow. We're a product of the outflow of the martyrdom of Stephen. It was a turning point for the church. It was also a turning point for a young man by the name of Saul. He's there watching all of this. And the words that Dr. Luke is going to use to describe Paul, as we'll see next week, it's words that are often used to describe a wild animal. Something happens in Saul after this martyrdom where he kicks persecution and murder of Christians into high gear. And of course, God will meet him on the road to Damascus, and that's, I don't, well, we'll talk about that next week together, but Saul was radically affected. I think he was radically affected, never, for, never forgetting the forgiveness in Stephen's voice. As he said the same thing Jesus said from the cross. Stephen said, Father, don't, don't attribute this sin to them. I bet Saul, deep in his heart, oh, he didn't say it outwardly, but deep in his heart he thought, I've never seen anything like that before. No doubt he was struck by the insight that Stephen, this, this Hellenist, this, this wasn't a Jew raised in religious schools that he was in. And his knowledge in the Old Testament, powerful. He was taken back by that. And, 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 and it's interesting, we'll see as we go through the rest of the book of Acts, Paul a lot of times copies Stephen's ministry. 
He goes right to the synagogue. He preaches about how <laughs> Israel's rejected their leader. It's almost like, like Paul got an education on how to spread the gospel by watching Stephen that day. And though at first he's going to react violently, eventually, eventually, he's going to turn his life over to the Lord and change the world forever. You see, as we move next week into chapter 8 and 9, we're going to see the conversions get a lot smaller in the church. In chapter 2 of Acts, 3,000 people. Chapter 3 of Acts, 5,000 people. Now there's 15, 20,000 people. That the only real convert of Stephen, and it took a while, was Saul, one guy. But what a one guy, huh? <laughs> Changed Christianity forever. In chapter 8, we'll also meet Philip. Philip's going to lead one you know, Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. And yet the entire strain of Coptic Christianity historically flows back to this conversation we're going to see between Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch. Just one guy. One guy, but what a one guy. And I, and I mention that to you in closing tonight because you have no idea how your one life can affect numbers beyond what you can imagine. And I don't just mean your life is in the good stuff in your life. The hard stuff in your life as well. You know, I, I, I think of, of, of Jim Elliott, who in 1948, about eight years before he was martyred, he wrote this in his journal, I seek not a long life, but a full one. Like you, Lord Jesus. I don't need to live very long. I just want my life to be full. I want my life to be effective. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, I'm sure for Elizabeth, his precious wife, having her husband be killed there down in Ecuador, the thought must have been, because she's a human, God, what did you do? What did you do? But what's happened to the Harani tribe since then is proof that the blood of martyrs is often the seed of the church. Many of them just knowing the Lord. We partner with a missions base down there right now that is literally an outflow of the martyrdom of Jim Elliot's life and ministry. You see, something changes when we, like the Apostle Paul, will later write. He'll write to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As we shared last Wednesday night, how do you stop that? How do you stop a guy who says, as long as you let me live, it's going to be all about Jesus. I'm just going to do what God has told me to do. Okay, we're going to kill you. Okay, great. Because then to die is, is, is gain. I get to be in the presence of the Lord and be rewarded. <laughs> you, you can't stop a person like that. And I think as you and I, not listen, I'm not... I'm not signing up to be martyred. I, I'm not, that's not volunteering. But when you and I say, I'm going to live for Jesus, and then, even when I die, that's, that's the bonus. We can go out into our world and serve and seek and be faithful right where God has told us to be faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's go before the Lord with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the way you love us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in our lives over and over and over again. And I pray, God, as we, as we just consider, Lord, Stephen, great servant, great preacher, great man of God, and the human side of us says, why did he have to die? And again, death is an enemy. Death, I, I believe with all my heart that you, you wanted us to stay in the Garden of Eden eating fruit and naming animals, but sin got in the way and death entered the picture and you, Jesus, died so that someday, practically, I know you've dealt with sin in a real way, but someday, practically, sin and death will be gone. Thank you for that, Jesus. But even now, you use death and trials and troubles to further the mission of what you're doing for good in this world. And for Stephen, his death, we saw, yes, a turning point for the church, now going to be forced out of Jerusalem. A turning point for young Saul, 
And something is going to start eating away at his heart that he'll react violently towards at first. But eventually will change him into the greatest missionary the church has ever known. God, you did something with this man that you took into your presence that day. And as I said earlier, Lord, I... I'm certainly not signing up for martyrdom. I'm not, I, I, I love, I love pastor in the garden and being with my family. I'm not in any hurry. But God, I just want to be faithful. We just want to be faithful to you every single day. And as long as you allow us to live, we want to be life is about Christ, about serving you, following you, not serving our flesh, not giving into our flesh. We want it to be about you. And then when we die, that's not a time for weeping. That's a time of rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus, that you, as we talked about last week, you have, you have made us more than conquerors. Thank you, Jesus. I pray we just live for you with all that we are. I pray for anyone listening tonight that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that tonight would be the night they'd commit their heart to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.